This is Words Aptly Spoken, which comes from Proverbs 25:11. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. The written word is a precious treasure. We want to preserve written knowledge for God's glory and as an anchor to the history of the church and its classical conversations. We hope to encourage the reading of words and of the word. So welcome to Words Aptly Spoken, where Jennifer Courtney, Timothy Knotts, and I discuss books from the Classical Conversations Curated Curriculum. Today is Wednesday, October 30th, 2024, and I'm Lee Bortons. And both Jennifer and I have been missing quite a few shows this last month as we've been traveling for Classical Conversations meetings. And so, Timothy, thank you for holding down the fort. But it's nice to have the three of us back again. Jennifer, what are we going to talk about? It's nice. Well, I, I am enjoying this month because we've been talking actually for a whole quarter. We're going to talk about cultivating Christian leaders. And while you and I were traveling and I, I figured out we talked to approximately 950 people in the last month. Um, but one of the things that I did was have a workshop on cultivating Christian leaders resources. So this is fun. But we've been talking um, about these resources that we have uh, curated for families. And so, so far, we've discussed Honey for a Child's Heart, which is a classic. Um, the Hurried Child, another classic. Nancy Piercy's Total Truth, which we got to really enjoy having a CC graduate and now employee, Daniel Shirley, on with us. And today, we're going to finish up with When People Are Big and God is Small. Yeah, it's really exciting because our biggest joy here in Classical Conversations is equipping parents. We trust you to equip your own children, and we're here just to give some guidelines and some support. So you can access all of our past episodes on my YouTube channel. It's at Lee Bortons, or you can go to my website, LeeBortons.com, in order to see both what we've been talking about for the last almost two years, as well as upcoming episodes in order to go ahead and purchase the books, we read through classicalconversationsbooks.com, our sponsor. All right, so let's get going. Okay, so you know what I'm going to ask you. Mm-hmm. Why is When People Are Big and God is Small one of the resources that we chose to recommend for um, growth in Christian leadership? Yeah, it's a book that's been around for quite a while in Classical Conversations. Mary Alf's um, uh Actually, she's been in charge of training. She's the one that picked it, and it was a popular book. Um, So the need was that, just what the title says, uh, people really sometimes think they're bigger than they are, and all of us in this conversation have that same problem. Um, I was thinking this week, in fact, about how I really want people to never say, or I know, I don't want to ever say, but I do all the time. For all have sinned and fall short of the standards of Lee. Mm. But that's not our measure, that God's much bigger than me. And when people rub me the wrong way, or I think they're inadequate, or compare myself to them, this book can help remind me that no, the Lord the one, is the one that's big. And I'm just here to serve his people, not to actually judge and condemn them. I remember one time I had a conversation with a non-Christian man who was exploring the Christian faith. And um He was going on and on about how bad people are. And I said to him, so you think you're better than the folks you're describing? And he said, I do. I don't do what they do. And I said to him, okay, how about if if you make that same comparison to Jesus Christ, then what do you think? And that's our problem. We forget who our real standard is. So I think this book is a really gentle reminder with really practical advice on how to make sure as not just a Christian leader, but as a Christian and as a parent, we really do try to use common sense, agape love, justice, all the things that our world right now is trying to tell us to neglect because people are so big now that they and the state have replaced God. And so we have so many tools available in order to help us to serve folks as well as to become more like our Lord and Savior. And this book is just one of our many, many resources in classical conversations because we know that will make us better parents. We're not raising children to be children, though we kind of wonder what's going on in our culture. We're raising our children to be brothers and sisters in Christ. And I believe all the books, whether it's our math curriculum, our science curriculum, or our parents' resources, Have that in mind. How can we teach our children to love the Lord with their whole mind, heart, and soul? This is just one more book that we add to um, 
uh, just to so many very various ways to get to know him better. Yeah, I really appreciate what you said. I thought about two applications for this book today. One is that we know that all of us as as homeschool parents have at various times been afraid that we are not enough, that we're not doing enough, that we're not doing it the right way, that we're somehow going to mar our children. They won't be able to do fill in the blank. And um, usually that fear has come in because we are focusing on the fear of man and not the fear of the Lord who has entrusted us with his children, even though he knows all of our failings. And um, so our, our focus, when our focus is off of pleasing him with the efforts of our hands, then that, that's when we become fearful of all the other authorities that we put up in place. And then the other thing is an expansion of that. And that is, um, I'm going to go, I'm, I'm going out of order, Tim, Sorry. forgive me, but um, I can't even remember what chapter this is in now, but I'll, I'll find it before we get off. But I, this quote really stuck out to me today. Members of a true community must go through the real face-to-face -face work of spending time together, being hurt, being honest with each other, asking forgiveness and learning to love and serve one another. And so it has application in our homes and in our communities. Okay. So we've been talking about these cultivating Christian leader books. Um, so who are these for? What do we mean when we say that Christian leaders? Mm. What do you guys think? Well, I know that I'm an optimist and I hope that every parent can rise to become a Christian leader. Um, no matter what talents or resources you've been given, I know our God and Savior wants to equip you to love him and make him known. So, but we also recognize that some people don't feel like they're leaders. And I feel like our curriculum, our communities, and the books on these cultivating, cultivating books are so that each of us can grow closer to our um, Lord and Savior and actually become a leader. You know, and Paul reminds us that we don't want to just drink milk. We want to get to meat. And so it really is anybody who's willing to step out in faith and serve. I love it that these were formerly parent resources. Um, and now they're Christian leader resources because every parent is a leader, at least in their home, whether they like it or not, and whether they're good at it or not, they are leading their children um so so i think it's, it's important that these are carefully selected the sort of things that are accessible to to parents maybe who who are busy or who aren't confident or who aren't experienced with lots of leadership books but these are a really um varied foundation of different kinds of things that will help you to grow to be a better leader and maybe that does lead, lead you to become a leader out more and more outside of your home as well mm -hmm. um you know we we love when parents step up in community right and take mm -hmm. on leadership as a tutor or as a director um uh, or join join our sales team right that's great um and we love to see people grow that way but they, but everyone is called to lead their children and, and we need to learn how to do that well. Yeah. That's one of the things that I was talking about with our, our book reps in the past few weeks. It's just that, um, we are all called to be leaders, no matter what some, some have small flocks, some have huge flocks <laughs> and, and, um, but that we are called and the only way the cultivating part of it is that we have to, um, plant the seeds in ourselves. And so I was telling them a story that I hadn't thought about in a while, but I, when I first started home educating, um, my husband, Tim, not Tim Knotts, my husband, Tim said something profound to me when I was wrestling one day over a choice of curriculum for one of the kids when they were very small. And, and he just said, well, I think the ultimate thing that matters in this decision is you as the teacher, because you are the main ingredient that they're going to follow. Um, the curriculum is just a tool for you. And that was so wise that I thought, wow, I really better feed myself as the leader of this small flock. And so I purposed that year 
and have done it ever since to read a classical education book every year, to read a parenting or discipleship book every year, and to study some subject in more depth than I've ever studied it before. Um, and so I, I even today, there's always fruit when you do that. So one of my kids has been wrestling with what does it mean, the fear of the Lord, that expression sounds negative. And so here, right here in the book, I found quotes to send to her. And so that's, to me, is a beautiful picture of the cultivating Christian leaders that as long as we keep feeding ourselves, then that will, that will sow seeds in the lives of our children and whoever else we're leading. I want to add two things. One is um, the leadership books within the cultivating Christian leaders. They're not your typical business books. We have those. And as a, as a leadership community, sometimes we'll read something real popular like Jim Collins, Good to Great, or a book on sales and marketing. But that's not what these books are for. They are actually for anybody who wants to just improve their walk with the Lord and serve the community better. So, um, you know, we spend all our time parenting, doing the very hardest thing. It's not teaching, reading, writing, arithmetic, or Latin, or logic, or any of that. It's teaching our children to govern themselves so that then they can obey the Lord, and they can submit to his rule when it's hard. And these books, I think, help us learn how to, as adults, to govern ourselves, because not everyone's raised in a Christian home or even a good Christian home. And some of us have been told over and over again, you know, go find yourself. And we're trying to say, no, a real leader goes and finds God, that they find truth and reality, not some construct that makes their life happier. And so the, the books are approachable, but, but they're also lofty in their goals um, because it's our character that makes it so that then we can serve others. And maybe that's when we need that business book or an economics book or a weightlifting book or whatever it happens to be. But it's hard to develop good habits if you don't have self-control. So um, we've seen, you know, movie after movie where kids are in trouble and then the parents afterwards are swearing or drinking or in trouble also when they don't recognize how that impacts their children. And we in classical conversations do. We spend a lot of time with those babies, even if you're not homeschooling and you spend a lot of time with them. Um, and so it's kind of putting on your own oxygen mask, which I've said a number of times. And that's why we enjoy the books that we have uh, in our cultivating classical leadership list. Yeah, and you touched on a couple of the important themes in this book. One thing that he talks a great deal about is obedience and self-control. Um, and that, that's the way, if you don't do that, and we don't train ourselves and our children to do that, that you're, you are under tyranny because you're a slave to your sins. Mm -hmm. um, and that that's part of this fear of the Lord is the obedience to him. And then... Um, Oh, I'm going to lose the other one. Well, it'll come back to me. That's okay. <laughs> Weave it in later. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Well, Tim, we always like to talk about the title on this show. And um, sometimes we do it late in the show because there are spoilers. But since we don't have fiction this week, this is not a spoiler. So this title might strike people as being really odd to the ear because it's called When People Are Big and God Is Small. And so your initial reaction to that might be, whoa. God is never small. What are you talking about? So what's he doing with this title? Yeah, I think it's actually a very clever title um, in the sense that it does sort of, um, at very first blush, it may not strike you weird. And then it makes you do a bit of a double take and say, well, wait a minute. And, um, and then when you look into the book, you realize that what, what he's talking about a lot in it is, is perspective um you know we um we talk about perspective with our foundations kids in in the hands on fine arts right they, they play with it a little bit and start to see how that works and as christians um people can seem very big to us because they're in our face right they're right there in front of us whereas eternal issues or god uh or things that are far in the future from us can seem to be of diminished size because they're far, they seem far away. Um, and, and one of the things I think that um, Edward Welch is doing in this book is trying to um, remove that optical illusion to, 
to make it clear that yes, people are there around us and present with us, but so is God and so is eternity, that they aren't far away, mm -hmm. even though sometimes they appear to us to be far mm -hmm. away. Uh, and so people can seem big and God can seem small, even though he never is small. I also think we live in a culture that wants him to just disappear. God's so inconvenient. And so um, I love the title for that reason, too, because he, he is never small, but it's us being God that makes it so that he can see him that way. Mm. Yeah. Okay, now I can weave back in my other thought because you led right into it. And that was, he does talk a lot in this book about um, the rise of this individual self after the French Revolution and the Industrial Revolution. And and um, and you touched on that when you were talking. Um, and that's what hit me um, hard in the face early on in the book was just him talking about when we do make people big and God small because of our perspective, we've set up idols just like any other idol that has been set up, um, the people around us can become idols. And then he has this very, in the intro, this very convicting list of questions, because we can also tend to think that, oh, well, only people who are true people pleasers fall into this trap. But his list of questions in the introduction will take that notion right away from you. <laughs> he pretty much comes up with a, a question that will fit everyone. So Jennifer, you're real good at talking about how all sin is adultery. Mm -hmm. Do you want to elaborate on that some? Because it ties yeah. in what you just said. Yeah. I mean, any anything that draws our hearts away from having God first and foremost in our lives is that is the sin. It is adultery. So if whether it's money or other people or um pride or whatever that is, it is it is all forgetting that we are the bride of Christ. And so to me, I think that adultery is that main category of sin. And that's why so much in the Old Testament that's used as the example of God's relationship with his people. So. Well, good. All right. So I, I jumped into the introduction. Now we're going to back up. <laughs> Um, we're going to back up. We do always look at the introduction at some point during our close readings, but there is also a nice preface because as Lee mentioned, this book has been around a long while. And I think this preface to the edition that we have is a, is a newer one. And so um, let's take a minute to look at it. Um, and, and this is what he says. Some books are classics. You read them again and again, and they seem to get better. No need for any updates. My books, I think, are best if they are refreshed every three years or so. By the time a book is published, I can already think of a number of changes I would like to make. Three years later, I wish I could redo the entire book. But second editions take work, and I tend to focus more on a project that's ahead of me than the ones behind me, so I rarely get to those changes. But not this time. PNR Publishing and Dave Almack graciously offered me the opportunity to take another look at when people are big after 26 years. And Amanda Martin was a huge help. Thank you, Amanda. The result is that much was added, much was tightened or removed, exclamation marks, which I now assiduously avoid, were deleted. <laughs> We've had a few curriculum projects where we had to go through and ax all the exclamation marks. I, I, I'm, I'm at fault. I know. I think we all do it now. Um, and then he says uh, in parentheses, if you see any, it means that Amanda went rogue. <laughs> and I was edified through the entire process, even when my old computer now replaced, not decided not to save a significant amount of work. Mm -hmm. Oh, boy, could I relate to so many things he said. <laughs> Most of the second you finish writing something, whether it's a blog post or <laughs> a piece of curriculum, you think of all, you see all the flaws and you want to revise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I also think when you are willing to revise your work, it's like it's a willingness to revise um, your life and to know that, you know, the status quo can always be improved upon. Mm -hmm. And there's always that goal of being a better bride and a, you know, a better leader. And so I appreciate that he took the effort um, because as classicalists, we do go out of our way to find modern classics, books that we think of will hold up the test of time, like Total Truth and some of the other ones we read this past month. And this book seems to fall into that category. 
Um, it's nice that he's a living author, not, you know, classical education so associated with dead authors. Mm -hmm. And that's also not true. We have a number of living authors in our curriculum and mostly in this cultivating Christian leadership um, category, as well as some of our American authors. And, uh, you know, they're there. So I just appreciate his willingness because it isn't always fun to go back and and grow and change. Yeah. I think it, it takes a degree of humility to be the kind of person who goes back to re-attack what you've mm -hmm. already worked so hard to make because it, there's a sense in which you're admitting that you were wrong or inadequate when you wrote it the first time. And um, I think it's a really healthy thing to acknowledge that what we made wasn't perfect and neither are we. Mm -hmm. And And so the the revision and rewriting process um you know it's like uh any of us who have been uh performers in music of any kind in our mm -hmm. lives and you you know you, there's a recording of you and you cringe when it comes mm -hmm. on your parents put it on you're like oh why <laughs> because we hate hearing ourselves and watching ourselves um, for the most part, unless, you know, unless you're one of those unusual people who really loves to watch themselves. <laughs> um, but I, I think a lot of us feel the same way about our writing, that mm. we work hard at it. And what we see when we look at it is all the flaws and not all of its benefits. Um, um, so that that diligence to go and and rework and rewrite um, can can bless not only our audiences by improving the ultimate artifact, but helps us too as we work through it. Well, we're often that often that living letter to people who won't read the Bible. And so that revision has a different meaning there too. Mm -hmm. I I have a also just quickly a fun because I know it's time for our break, but I do have quickly a fun thought. This is my theory about the exclamation marks. We have it is hard when you are communicating in a book or a text or on a chat app like Teams, where which we use at work to communicate your emotion because people are only using their one sense, which is seeing the message. And so I think the temptation to use exclamation marks is really that attempt to connect with your reader and be excited with them about an idea, which you don't really have the chance to do because you're not bodily in person with them. So I try to, I mean, although we do ruthlessly eradicate them, I also try to be patient because I think that's what's happening. We're trying to connect and, and express emotions and we only have that limited sense to do it. So, well, brevity is associated with putting people down or being short with them, right? We had that phrase. And so lots of times when I'm texting, I'll add an exclamation mark to say, yeah, I know it's short, but I'm happy. Yeah, but it's good. All it's about. Yep. <laughs> Well, that's interesting what you just said. So an exclamation instead of being excited has maybe come to mean all is well. Yeah. <laughs> and that's not a bad thing to say to somebody. Yeah, that's good. All right. Well, it's time for thank our sponsor, classicalconversationbooks.com, where the books discussed can be purchased. We have the entire 2023 and 2024 words aptly spoken calendar at leadbordens.com with links to the classicalconversationsbooks.com site and watch for the 2025 calendar as um, we continue to add to the various books we want to talk about. Next week, we're going to continue with our Christian leadership series by uh, discussing the pattern of God's truth written by, I hope I say his name right, Frank Gabeline. And I think it will be another great explanation of the things we've been talking about in the past few months. We just have lots of tools available to us and we need to make use of them. Yeah. All right. Well, I think it's the time when we start to look at some close reads and um, in a providential turn, I, I brought up idols and now I'm going to read mm -hmm. a passage in the book that has to do with idols. So um, when we, when we talk about fearing people, sometimes we associate it with being afraid of persecution, but Welch kind of disabuses us a little of that notion and, and broadens the idea of man fearing. So I'm going to read this selection, which has the subheading, our idol of choice. What is it that shame and fear of rejection have in common? 
The problem is not that we care about being exposed or rejected. Everyone should care about such things. God certainly cares about shame and mistreatment. What they share is they either don't know how to find hope and comfort in God's words, or they simply do not turn to him. Meanwhile, other people gradually grow to outsized proportions. That's what happens with those things that we especially desire. They don't stay put. To use a biblical image, people become an idol and our idol controls us. We could even say that we worship when we try to please, hoping they will return the favor and fill us up with esteem, love, admiration, acceptance, and respect. When we think of idols, um, we are talking about human creation. So then we have our spouses, our children. Um, so, so we we like to think sometimes about these Old Testament idols. I'm, I'm expounding now on what he said, yeah. but we think about Baal and money and power. But sometimes we forget about those other ones, our family, our children. So... Yeah, I'm sure you've been accused like I have of even making homeschooling an idol. And it's and people would have been right, especially in the early years, because think how many people make STEM classes an idol or college degree an idol. Um, we really do ha have a difficulty confusing our passions and our responsibilities with uh, God's providence and what he would have us do. Yeah. And... Some, we can make our children idols in a couple of ways. And I've done both of these things. I'm sure that we, that our entire audience has. One is when we're so, um, we have them so protected that we then enter into community conflict, right? Mm -hmm. There's, there's, it's no accident that we have that expression. The mama bear is coming out. So sometimes we make our children an idol and then we have conflict that we shouldn't have with someone else in our community mm -hmm. because instead of discipling our children, we wanted to protect them from something or stand mm -hmm. up for them when they really needed to be corrected. That's, that is a hard idol for me. I want to protect my children. You know, um, Tim, as a man, you probably want to protect your children as much, if not more than Jennifer and I as mothers. How do you just, how do you know when you're in protection mode and it's appropriate versus, you know, you, you almost become a mama bear? <laughs> it's a, I think it's different. Um, I think moms tend to um, be tempted to micromanage the, the protection Mm -hmm. uh, you know, to to be the 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 watching over all the time kind of mama, or the you know, the mother hen gathering her chicks under her under her wings kind of protection. Um, I think dads generally tend to to let kids be a little more free range, but but when the danger presents itself, um, the maybe the protection comes out in a little bit more of a explosive kind of a way. Um, and and extreme uh, and i don't necessarily mean violent but uh you know you see um in any kind of community church uh homeschool community whatever it is um if the children's feelings are being hurt or mom's mama's feelings are being hurt most of the time dad will sort of just try and talk it down but if it comes out too much if it's too strong or too frequent then then dad's usually like well that we're done with that like pull the plug it's finished like we're not going to deal with it anymore and so there's this a a tearing apart that happens mm -hmm. rather than trying to resolve the issues by working them out like jennifer read just a minute ago instead of living in community and and doing the hard work of resolving conflicts instead the temptation is to resolve by cutting off, right? Mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. leave, just leave it. Mm -hmm. Just cut that person out of your life. Have nothing more to do with them. Um, I think that's more often the dad's response. Uh, it, it's, I think, balanced against the way that moms more often deal with it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I mean, and again, there's that added thing that husbands not only look to protect the children, but often their wife uh, um, in, in that. Um, mm -hmm. And to turn it around, Jennifer, you're, you know, that protection of children, making an idol out of them by protecting them. I think there's also that temptation to make an idol out of them by living vicariously through them or mm -hmm. by tr showing them off in some kind of a pride. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, 
every every parent i think has that temptation that you you know you your kid does something and you're like wow that's great this is my kid's the first kid ever to walk before they're one year old the man look how amazing they are <laughs> um and of course it's not amazing to anyone ex really except for you um but we can still turn that into a, an idol to, to really seek our identity and our satisfaction in what our children are doing instead of really finding that in the Lord. Yeah. And I like how in the book he talks about when you do that when you're not looking for the hope and comfort in God's words or him personally. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's when it creeps into our homeschooling in, in another way, which is that we feel that fear of man. And so we feel like we have to use our children mm -hmm that they're the proof that what we're doing is good and that it's going to work. And so when we're putting that idol up, instead of focusing on the discipleship of our children, then. Mm -hmm. You know, that happens a lot, even in our business community, because classical conversations, it's a business and we um, try to encourage people across the globe and it costs, you know, money to do that. Um, and there's just this, uh, just this desire to, always get things right. And yet we know we couldn't have grown classical conversations if we didn't have folks that couldn't get it right because none of us really know classical Christian homeschooling education. And so there's this balance between respecting things when it goes badly and knowing that's just the way the world is and how we start something new. And this demand that everybody be measured to my standards on the opposite side of things. And so I think this book's just really good in helping people step back and think, okay, where is this person coming from? What what are their abilities? And how can I, instead of being mad at them, point them closer to God, even if I'm the one that's the customer, right? You've done, I, I know I've done that where I've gotten mad at like a retail person. And afterwards thought, why didn't I just help them with their job rather than getting mad at them? So this book, I think, gives you a lot of good practical advice to find that way to serve when you don't really feel like it. Yeah, that's good. Okay, well, I'm going to move us on to our next close passage. So um, we, we a lot of times when we have um, temptations and we start to then have excuses about why we aren't fearing God and loving him. And, and those things usually sound like, well, if only fill in the blank. <laughs> so um, in this mm -hmm. book, Welch does not pull any punches debunking some of our favorite um circumstantial arguments, our favorite, well, if onlys. So Tim, do you want to read this passage for us? Yes. So he starts, if only my husband would encourage me more, if only my wife would respect me, if only my children would obey me, if only he or she would show some interest in me, if only my parents would give me more independence. Can you hear it? The love cup lives Fill me when I, and then I will be happy. We tend to see ourselves as people who need something from somebody if we're going to change. This is the popular view of people. Piece together a popular view of the person looks like this. Number one, our basic identity is that of a receptacle, a cup that holds psychic needs. Number two, we have a long list of psychic needs, but these mm -hmm. needs tend to cluster around basic needs for love and significance. Number three, when these needs are not met, we are in a deficit and we feel empty. Number four, we must be careful who fills these needs. Either we can look to people or we can look to Jesus. Yeah, so uh, one of the things that he does throughout the book, in addition to talking about that, um, well, they're connected, but in addition to talking about the revolution that led to the cult of the self versus the community, he talks a lot about psychology. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's it's easy to see this and, you know, to point at that need for um, romantic love or spousal love and support, but maybe to draw it back for a minute to someplace that's a little less obvious jennifer to talking about children um you know as our children grow up uh they need us less or at least in less obvious ways and less frequently than they did when they were young and 
uh, that often can leave us feeling that deficit, right? We don't have the immediate snuggle from our little one that we have been so used to having when they were little. Um, and so then we end up with a, a hole in our, like in our affection feeding that we look for places to get it filled and that can become awfully unhealthy. So I have a question about this passage. He says a popular view of the person and describes step one, two, and three, which sound very popular. But then he goes on to four. So is he saying steps one, two, and three are inaccurate or that they are accurate, but are only helpful if you would look to Jesus rather than something else to fill it up? What do you think, Tim? I was wrestling with that too. Yeah. Um, I think when he means po what he means by po a popular view isn't um, what the popular view of people is, but the um, that perspective of the person from inside looking out. Right. We we need um, we need the popular. We need the populace around us to fulfill our needs. We need um, we need others because we have a um, what does he call it? A, we're, we're a leaky container, <laughs> I think is the way he puts it, that we we get what we need, but it, we don't keep it. It drains out and we need to be constantly refilled. Um, and so we, we choose where we are going to get that filling from. Either mm -hmm. it's going to be from people, which makes us ultimately man fearers, because if we rely on others for that filling, then we're always having to um, appease them or make them feel like they're getting something from us so that we can reciprocate and get back what we need. Um, right. Or, or we, or we trust in God in Jesus because he can fill us and doesn't need us. We just need to come to him. Yeah, I, that leaky love cup is kind of a popular way to talk about the holes in our lives and that somebody needs to fill us. Um, and my understanding of reading the um, the discussions I've had with the book, we used to have trainings around it, was that the leaky love cup was um, helped describe sometimes when a person didn't really necessarily even need the right answer from us. They just needed to know there was a friend nearby who would support them and, and maybe give them answers or maybe just love on them while they went through what they were doing. And that could help seal up uh, the struggles that they were having. Yeah. And the, and the times that in my own life, when those friends have been mm -hmm. the most helpful is, is being there, but also sometimes turning my questions or frustrations around and so, and this happened just recently with my best friend, I was sharing some things with her and, and she said, um, well, it sounds like you're tired and therefore you're, you're vulnerable to mm. be under attack. And so here's some scriptures that I like to pray when I'm tired, maybe those will work for you or maybe of other ones, but probably you should spend some time praying. And that was a good, that's a good friend to, mm -hmm. to, you know, she, she didn't cut me off. She let me say what I needed to say, but she also didn't leave it there. Mm -hmm. oh, good. All right. Well, Lee, I think you're going to read our next one. Um, so we've, we've just been kind of talking about ourselves as leaky cups, which can lead to self-pity. Um, uh, but he does point us to some remedies. So do you want to read this one for us? Sure. Who are we? Armed with an understanding of God, the question, who is the human person becomes fairly straightforward. How are people similar to the creator God? The object of God's greatest affections is God himself. He wants his glorious holiness to fill the earth. Therefore, our prayer should be hallowed be your name. People are most similar to God when he's the object of their affection. People should delight in God as he does in himself. We are to make his name famous or hallowed throughout the world. We are to declare the coming of his glorious kingdom. As the first answer of the Westminster, oh, sorry, Westminster Catechism says, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him, meaning delight in him, forever. Then we look for identities through which we live out our connection to God. 
Look for the words you are. Instead of the image of God in human beings taking the form of a love cup or a hollow core of language of longing, the image is more accurately that of Moses as he literally reflected the glory of God in Exodus 34, 29, 32, like the moon reflects the light of the sun. Mm. So here he's kind of contradicting this love cup idea. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Tim. You go ahead. Almost like we're a love cup that God reshapes, right? Mm -hmm. He 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 takes us and makes us not concave and leaky anymore. Uh, instead, allows us to become that reflective surface mm -hmm. that reflects who He is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, because I, I think it's good to go concave versus convex um, and reflecting rather than taking. So instead of sucking in all the sunshine, all the joy, all the glory he has for us, that we just can't help but reflect it back. Yeah. And I appreciate over and over and over in the book, he gives examples of people in scripture who acted out of fear. So Abraham, when he lied about Sarah being his wife, um, Peter, when he denied Christ, those are times when they made people big and God small because they were afraid of what man could do to them. And yet he, both of those men were used by God. It's not like that was the end for them. He turned their story around and they did reflect his glory in a, in a mighty way. So. Mm. Okay, we have one last excerpt and almost no time as usual, but <laughs> we'll, we'll go ahead and read it and see how, how many, we may only get to say one little thought about it. Um, but our, the last one pushes back on some of the, the hardest things from being a God fear instead of a man fear, um, loving our neighbors, even when they're the very ones we fear. And sometimes when we rightly fear them because they have made themselves our enemies. So Tim, will you read this hard section? Yeah. Call love your enemies. God calls us to treat enemies the same way we treat friends and family. Impossible? Of course. But not when we have the fear of the Lord. When we know that God's power is greater than that of our enemies. When we know that God is just. And when we know that God loved us while we were his enemies. Then we are free to be simple servants who imitate and obey the Father. He blesses the righteous and the unrighteous with rain and food. And so we consider how to bless. To love in this way, we need both power and discernment. We need power because we are incapable of loving the way Christ has loved us. We need discernment because it is sometimes difficult to know what form love should take. As a result, anytime we are aware that we have specific enemies, we should seek help from the church in order to discern how to express our love for them. So one of and early on in the book, one of the ways he turns around this, you know, psychology of, I, I think we could probably all agree that the, that a very loud message in culture is love yourself, um, <laughs> fulfill you know your, you and make you known exactly. And so what what he of course turns around and says, no, the the commandment, the greatest commandment that Jesus gives us is to love the Father and love our neighbors, um ourselves it doesn't say love yourself in there yeah well and a lot of our errors fall on one side or the other even you know people just claim to love god and ignore their neighbor and then it's very very popular now to love your neighbor no matter what they're doing and totally ignoring god's justice and righteousness you have to have both yeah and how and how you love i think is a really good point here too that all love doesn't look the same, right? Mm -hmm. We love our children in different ways at different times according to their needs. Sometimes it's tough love. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's telling them a hard truth instead of, uh, you know, snuggling them and, and rubbing their hair. Uh, those are, are different kinds of love. Um, but but to love and not to hate, um, I think is is an important part of our commission and mm -hmm. and helps us to be that, mirror of god right because he um he's the one who pours out that 
reign on the just and the unjust, and we need to be like him. Yeah. Well, with that, I thank you guys for all the effort you put into being like him and the love that I see you share, not just with your families, but with your churches and our Christian community of academics. And I just um, thank you that we get this time to talk about these great books that help us to do better. And knowing that every day, like I like, you know, I like to say this, I go to bed every night repenting. I die with Christ and I wake up knowing his mercies are new. And I think this book gives you the grace for that too. So thank you for sharing with us and we'll see you next week. Hi everyone. Guys. Nice.